So uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Michael Lebenek. I'm a senior developer advocate for AWS and with AWS Mobile. And uh, I'm here to talk about progressive web apps. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the way software kind of used to be not too long ago. And that included a picture of a floppy disk, just to keep me honest here. But uh, you know, the way we used to consume software used to be a lot different. Um, installing it on our machines, purchasing it in stores. These days, we kind of download everything or view everything in a browser. So that, that shift kind of, I relate that a little bit to things like, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, like VHS tapes and then to DVDs and that whole switch just happened so quickly. And uh, now I can't go to the video store anymore. But uh, how, many, how many of you check your email in a web browser? So it's, uh, you know, that whole shift happened very fast is uh, kind of the point here. Now there's, there's also a similar trend kind of happening in mobile. So with mobile, there's a, a large shift to doing things on your mobile device and, and including things like digital media. So with uh, broadband connections and, and things like LTE and 4G, this is the latest Comscore stats on digital media consumption and 50% on mobile devices now consumed on and time spent on um, digital media. So similarly, with web apps, um, you'd call it the mobile web, there's a, a large increase in unique visitors for consuming things via the mobile web instead of mobile apps. So kind of why is this? It's because um, you don't have to go to the app store. We're used to going in our browsers and searching for things just like we do on our desktops. So it's, it's an easier thing to do. And with uh, late, you know, browser technology becoming more and more um, powerful on mobile devices. If you remember you know, a long time ago, kind of trying to build things on a mobile device or in a browser, it'd be slow and laggy and, and things like that. But you know, devices are a lot more powerful now. So um, being able to deliver things via a browser is, is very powerful. It's always up to date. And it's a very strong way to interact with your customers and always keep your application updated without having to deal with app stores. So. Um, if anybody is, is anybody here, everybody here familiar with Mobile Hub? No. So AWS Mobile Hub is a man is a service, an orchestration service similar to things like CloudFormation or Elastic Beanstalk. You know, it doesn't cost anything, but it allows you to orchestrate your your mobile backend. So things like push notifications and hosting and streaming and content delivery and NoSQL databases. It allows you to go in with a few clicks and spin up an entire backend very simply. For, for a, makes it easy for a front end developer to orchestrate an entire backend similarly to scripting something with CloudFormation. It also allows you to manage the native aspects of a mobile app like push notifications, putting in your APN keys or, the, or your um, Google push keys as well. So we have a lot of um, large customers running production mobile apps. Um, the ones you see highlighted here are actually utilizing PWAs um, with, for mobile delivery as well. So what is it, why is this? What, what is a progressive web app? A progressive web app is essentially a responsive web application. It's built with whatever framework you want. It's built with HTML and JavaScript. And it's defined by something called a manifest.json file, and also using HTML meta tags in, a, in the index.html file. The, the manifest file, we'll get a little more into that, defines the native look and feel of the, of the web app when it's installed on the device. And then it's dis discoverable and installable. So you can do things like uh, add to home screen, if you've seen on your mobile device. When you do this, it essentially installs the, the progressive web app onto your device and fires an event in something called a service worker, which you can capture that event, and you could send metrics, and you can um, send events to things like anal analytics services and things like this. And, and, your, and your app is now searchable on the web. So search engines are now indexing native apps. So this is um, searchable just like any other web application. Which, so in, in terms of that, there's, there's a lot of other benefits. So there's a, in terms of discoverability and searching of it, there's also, it's also network agnostic. So, one of the big things with progressive web apps is the ability to run offline. So we, we have all these great connections here, but you know, across the world there's not, you know, it's spotty and there's little to no connections and mobile connections in general are, are pretty spotty. So depending on where you are. So 
so, uh, with progressive web apps and service workers, you, you essentially get a, a programmable network proxy where you can detect if you're online or offline. And I'll show you a demo of this in a bit. But uh, also in terms of being up to date and submitting your app to the App Store and going through that whole thing, you know, that, that essentially is all gone with progressive web apps. You're just pushing out updates as you normally would to, to a website for a progressive web app, updating the code in the cloud. So uh, some of the core components of a progressive web app, there's really three. There's the application shell, which is the UI of your, of your progressive web app. It contains HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, and the service worker. The service worker is, a, is the programmable network proxy where you, it's essentially a background worker. It's running in the background. It's handling tasks like checking if the network is available and interacting with storage and cache. So storage and cache includes things like local storage in the browser and uh, things like IndexedDB, which is a more scalable, modern, indexable database in the browser. So with the app shell, generally, you want to load it always from cache. So the concept with a progressive web app is essentially get all your files, your JavaScript, your HTML, your CSS, cache it locally on the device, and you're always loading it from there. You can always check versions and do things like uh, update the files, essentially, so they have different file names or prefixes, so they update when you want them to update. But generally, the first thing you do with an app shell is cache it, and then you always serve it from the, from the local cache. So if there's no connection, you know, at the very minimum, the, you will always load the UI and be able to, your users will always be able to load your application. And you could also check things like uh, if you're online or offline. So uh, you can also do native integration. We'll get a little more into this. But with uh, the manifest.json file defines the look and feel of your progressive web app. So supporting these current browsers right now, and there's more support up and coming. But it's essentially a simple JSON document. It controls the native appearance of the application when you add it to the home screen, defines the, the icons, all the sizes, the things you would do when you publish it to the App Store. <clears throat> you can also define a splash screen. You can define the look and feel of the status bar on the top. You can really control the entire look of the web app so the user essentially doesn't see any browser at all. Um, for other platforms, even Windows, you can define these types of things in the, index, in the um, HTML metadata. So for the browsers that don't support manifest file, you can define these things on the metadata as well to control the look and feel. You can, uh, in terms of device APIs now, for, for the PWAs, you can also interact with things like geolocation, device orientation, control of you know, landscape or portrait type of stuff. And there's also a full screen API. So you can remove the, the address bar of the browser and, and run the app as it look, looking just like a native app. And things like click to call and, and other things as well. There's a lot of native integration you can integrate with PWS. Um, one of the more powerful things and, and newer things is sign-in and credentials. So this is a standards browser-based API available on the Navigator object that you can do things like federate with local device accounts. So uh, sign in with whatever account they have on their, on their device, as well as automatically signing in. And it, and it can also fall back to, uh, to uh, just a browser-based sign-in as well. But it'll allow you to federate credentials as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the service worker. Like I said, it's a programmable network proxy, but it cannot access the DOM. So this is a strictly a background process that's running, that's intercepting things like network requests and stuff. And uh, it, it responds to the post message event, which is a, standards, uh, a standard messaging protocol in the browser. And it does have access to index DB APIs natively. So uh, that's a much more powerful solution than something like local storage which you can use in a service worker. A service worker has a life cycle. So when a user installs a, a PWA and does add to home screen, an event's going to fire. It's going to be the install event, which you can capture. And you can send off to an analytics service. You can store it in a local cache. Then it's going to be activated. The activation event is going to run every time it loads. And then it's going to be in an idle state. And then there will also be an error state if something goes wrong. But then the, the fetch event is, uh, is always going to run when a network request is, is sent. So if you do something like sign in, you load some data from a database or Dynamo or anything like that, it's always going to come down and run through this fetch event. So that gives you a chance to capture that data, store it locally in something like IndexedDB or local storage. And uh, essentially, you can also queue, do things like queuing up requests, which would give you the ability to check if something failed 
and uh, rerun those requests later on when the network has come back online. So you could always detect if the network is online or offline in your app using, using just a standard JavaScript. But with a service worker, you can control whether it's loaded from locally on the device or it's pulled from the network. So, so this is an example of one of the, of how to use an event listener. So um, the top line there is defining the files to cache. So like I said, when you, when you initially, um, the app shell is always going to cache initially and you can define what you cache. So defining paths lets you say, I want to cache this, this, and this. Maybe there's something you don't want to cache and you want to make sure you always pull it from the network. You just define those things and giving it a cache name and you store that thing locally and you can see it in the browser debugger as well, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, so you can see an example here of the install event too, which you could do, th do things like um, caching the files as w and then returning them. So as far as fetching and caching data, like I said, the fetch API is available. You can, uh, a, a, kind of a standard practice is ca um, setting up a key in terms of IndexedDB. This is just using a local cache, but you can use the data URL as, as like a key, as an index key to determine what kind of calls were made and what were failed. So if the network goes online, you could always have, okay, which request is coming in, check it. So you could see it's just checking, is this request the data URL that I've defined as something I want to check for if I'm online or offline, and then either cache it or respond with the network request. So storage and cache, local storage, which maybe you're more familiar with, is a, is a blocking and a synchronous um, storage mechanism. So it is not, it's not very scalable, and it's, but it's very easy to work with. IndexedDB is a newer standard and is asynchronous, and it's a transactional system. So APIs are, like I said, available in the service worker natively, but, you, but they can be pretty complex. So they're, they're a little difficult to work with, and there's a, a library called Local Forage, which makes it a little easier to work with and wraps it around in a, in a simpler way, just kind of like a get and, get and put type of model, similar to local storage. So a, a good strategy for PWAs is called a cache first, then network, and this essentially means cache all your data first and then update, update the UI and then fetch the latest data from the network. And you could do this asynchronously. So you can load data always from cache and then you can request data down from the network and then just always keep the cache updated. But the PWA is just always loading from the local cache, which makes it very fast and you don't have to worry about the connections. And like I said before, if you are offline, you can always know that and you can fire events that update the UI even and say there's no network connection, which you may, maybe you've seen in some apps. So in terms of debugging, there's a lot of support for debugging now in the latest browsers. Firefox has a debugging. This is specifically for service workers. So and uh, Chrome or Chromium-based anything has a dev tools, has an application tab that allows you to debug the service worker. You can add breakpoints, you could step through the code. You can see if it's been updated, if it's been activated. You can inspect the database, the data in the index DB, and things like that. It's uh, pretty powerful. So I'm uh, going to switch this to actually run through a quick demo and show, show a little bit of that to you. So this is an example of, a, of an Ionic app I have running in, in Chrome right now, and I also have Firebox. But you can see here in the, hopefully you can see, in the, uh, in the debugger, I have what's called an application tab open here. And I'll be able to see things like my manifest file, which defines my name. And these are things that I've defined in the JSON document. But you'll be able to inspect these and kind of see what the properties all are, the icons, the splash images, and stuff like that. The service worker, now I can see that I have a service worker lo loaded, which Ionic, uh, Ionic actually provides out of the box when you generate a new app. And you can see it's activated. If I, if I refresh, I have something here checked called update on reload. If you don't have this checked, it will actually just keep the current service worker. And this is always going to be there running in the background. And if you're, for development purposes, it's good to have this checked because when you do things like live reload and you're writing code, it's going to constantly update the service worker with a new version. You can also simulate network requests here, which is very useful. So if you click this, your application will essentially go offline. So you can control and test how, how it looks when it's offline. The, uh, you can also do things like clear storage and stuff like that, clean things out. 
So you can see under storage here, there's local storage. There's gonna, the AWS SDK for JavaScript is installed in here, so you'll see things like Cognito credentials and, and things like that loaded in local storage, with the, which the JavaScript SDK does out of the box. But you'll also see IndexedDB here too, which is something that I'm using local forage in this particular app to interact with. So you'll see there's a key value pairs here. So I've, cap I've captured things like the activated event, put um, some example key values, and capture the fetch event. So you'll see there's a URL here for Cognito, which I use to sign in. So storing these things in here essentially lets me, um, the, the SDK for JavaScript will automatically maintain a session for me in the browser, but I can do things like cache the Cognito object here. If I go offline, I can know if that session has already been established and not worry about changing the UI or doing something offline. I could still maintain that and by checking the date timestamps on there. And then you'll see also I have a DynamoDB endpoint here. So this essentially lets me load data. This is a simple to-do app here. So I can load these to-do items into the app, cache them in the index DB, just as the, the DynamoDB query comes down, exactly the way it does, exactly the way my app is expecting it. So my app doesn't care if it's, I'm just intercepting this in the service worker. So the service worker is putting it in index DB for me, it's doing, essentially doing that cache first, the network. It's always keeping the cache updated. The, the app is loading from the cache, and then the network is constantly keeping my items updated. So one thing that this app in particular will do is if I go back into service workers here and check offline, it will, it will notify me and say the network status has changed offline. And now I'm updating my app UI to say, to let my user know that my network connection was lost and I'm now offline, I'm operating in offline. This part, you can do different things here. So you have access to this in a basic HTML JavaScript area for doing things like window event listeners to know if you're online or offline. That's just standard JavaScript. But in the, in the service worker, you can catch the failed requests. So if I do something like keep this offline box checked and reload the application, you'll see I still get my items. And that's because they're coming from the, the cache. And, uh, and another thing you can do also is, so what happens if I say a user creates a new item while I'm offline? So you can do that still fairly easily by just queuing up requests. So if I add an online, if I add a new to-do item and I create it while I'm offline, it'll still create it while I'm offline. And then when I go back online, it will, it will um, run that request in a queue. So I'll cache all the failed requests and it'll rerun them when I come back online. And I'm just detecting that with a standard navigator object. But if I reload, again, you'll see it. I have two to-dos there. And then I go back online. You'll see it tells me my network status has changed back to online. And my items are still there. If I reload, it should be still there. So now I have my items here completely accessible offline and online. And I didn't have to submit this to the App Store. And I can always keep it up to date by pushing my code just up to S3. This is hosted on S3 and uh, by testing it locally as well. So uh, just to give you a quick idea here, this is, so this is Chrome and Firefox as well. This is the Firefox developer edition which you could download. It's essentially Firefox, but has a, a, some more tools in terms of debugging and stuff like that. But you could see similar items here. If I refresh, I'll get the same items I had there before. And the debugger is fairly similar here. You can see the the cache store, the index DBs. You can see the items in the index DB. You see the same things here. Now, the one thing here that Firefox has is a pretty good debugger. If you go into, uh, this is this URL here, about colon debugging, you'll see service worker is installed, similarly to in Chrome. But you can click this debug button and you'll get a debugger. So here's my service worker here. And if I wanted to say, place a breakpoint and kind of see what's going on in the service worker, I can actually place those in there, reload my app, and it'll actually pause and break on that line of code. It makes it very easy to debug and really um, write these service workers in the background processes. So I can step into this code, I can see where variables are. It's like a full, you know, like you're writing a desktop application here as well. So there's a standard debugging tools to kind of step through the code or start it, and now you'll see it kind of kept going there. And you'll see some of the console logs here is basically running in the service worker. So I'm checking to see the fetch requests. You'll see there's a Dynamo request there. 
I know this is AWS data because I'm checking for it with these data URLs here. You can just check on these, these event request URLs to see what, what the data URLs for this current fetch item. And you'll see some of these local forage um, interfaces here, which make it a lot easier to interact with IndexedDB. So it's basically just setting key value items. So I'm setting a key, a data URL with what the fetch request was for. And I'm also caching all the items down there and, and logging some things out. Local Forage and IndexedDB in general, with Local Forage, you can also use different um, storage methods. So you could define a driver here, and you can pass in an array, and you can say, okay, local, you can give it a priority, local storage, IndexedDB, or WebSQL, and it will, it will manage what's available and use whatever is available. But the, the API remains the same, which is pretty useful. So you don't have to worry about where IndexedDB is available and where it isn't. So um, given this is an Ionic app, we have Max, he's the CEO of Ionic, and he's gonna run through how this, we have something called a AWS Starter Kit for Ionic, and uh, Max is gonna run through that with you on Mobile Hub and how this app was generated. And also this code will get pushed to uh, AWS Labs for you to check out and, and see the service worker and play with. So I'm gonna hand it over to Max for Ionic for here. Thank you. Cool. Right. Oops. All right, so uh, building PWAs uh, involves a lot of new web APIs that, frankly, a lot of web developers just kind of are, are totally new to. So. Uh, I kind of think that the, the web APIs are very low level, uh, and writing them from scratch is it's probably not something that you're going to do a lot. And thankfully, there are a ton of frameworks and build tools and libraries that make interacting with these new web APIs like service workers a lot uh, easier. So chances are, if you're building web apps today and you're using a modern, popular front-end framework like React or Angular or Ember, there are a ton of libraries and tools to help you either do app shell architecture uh, to do certain caching techniques. Um, some frameworks actually generate uh, on build time the service worker code that caches all the files and kind of keeps them updated for you so you actually don't have to write anything. Uh, there's a bunch of build tools like Workbox, which you should definitely check out if you're gonna write service workers because they let you build service workers in a kind of higher level uh, syntax, so you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, and then finally, when you're interacting with the storage engine, like Michael mentioned, uh, things like the local forage make it a lot easier, so you don't have to have a lot of messy custom code to switch between the different storage engines, different browser support, uh, et cetera. So uh, before you go and write a bunch of service worker code and learn the APIs, just check out what your framework has to offer, what these other libraries can do for you. So uh, I'm gonna uh, do a quick demo of using Ionic Framework with AWS Mobile Hub. Uh, but quickly before I do that, I think I just wanna like introduce people to what Ionic is. Uh, so Ionic Framework's an open source UI framework kit. Open source UI kit focus on helping web developers build mobile apps, whether that's for the App Store or increasingly for progressive web apps. So we kinda see the web as this fluid thing that runs in a lot of different contexts and if you're a web developer and you know HTML and JavaScript and CSS, we give you a bunch of pre-made UI components that you can put together to build awesome apps. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a, well, it is very much a cross-platform thing. Uh, it's 100% open source, MIT licensed. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a lot of usage on it. Millions of apps have been created, over 30,000 stars on GitHub. Uh, and we're really, really excited about progressive web apps. Uh, for a while, it was kind of looking like the App Store was going was gonna to win, and all of a sudden, PWAs came out of nowhere. Uh, and and I, I'm a web developer. I like having the ability to just push my app without having to go talk to someone or pay you know, a fee. Like, I, I love the freedom of the web, and I think a lot of people do. And I'm excited that PWAs are kind of bringing back the relevance of the web. Uh, but we believe at Ionic that you should be able to target both App Store and PWAs with the same code. So uh, we've been fortunate to work with the AWS mobile team 
to build an official Ionic plus AWS starter project. So Michael demoed a little bit of it, but I'm gonna actually go through kind of step-by-step -step connecting it with Mobile Hub, showing you how all the services get auto-provisioned, uh, and then show how you can then go and deploy that as a web app, um, as kind of a, as a PWA. So a little bit of an intro to Mobile Hub, but uh, it's, it's definitely relevant if you wanna actually go and deploy your app. Uh, so let's jump into a little bit of a demo here. So uh, Ionic has a CLI, much like the AWS CLI, for starting new projects. And the command for doing that is Ionic start, the name of your app, and then the name of the AWS starter. And th this will actually go through and download and install the project. It'll pull the starter template that we built with the AWS team and configure everything and, and get it to go. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna risk that. <laughs> uh, doing an N NPM install is always risky on, on, in these situations. So I already have a, a project that's already created. And when we, when we create the project, what we have here is a, a stock Ionic app, but there's one important file here that, that's kind of different. This is this mobile hub project.zip. So when we generate the project, we actually go and create a pre-configured AWS mobile hub project that you can literally go and just drag and drop and import directly into mobile hub. So I'm gonna go and open up mobile hub here. So the way that you find it, if you're, if you're just at the, the landing page here is you just search mobile hub in the services, uh, it's a separate page. So I'm gonna bump up the zoom. Okay, so to get our project into mobile hub, all we need to do is click import We'll go back to Finder and drag and drop this zip file right in here. And then we'll do import project. So this unzips this zip file, finds our pre-configured uh, AWS mobile hub project, and then goes in provisions DynamoDB, Amazon Pinpoint, Cognito. And it shows us here all the services that we have configured. So we've got Pinpoint set up for messaging and analytics. We're, we're not gonna do that as part of this demo. Uh, AWS, uh, Amazon Cognito is set up, and we have it configured automatically with email and password authentication. So we can go in here and see that we have uh, some basic password requirements, et cetera. And this is just a much simpler way to just quickly interact with Cognito instead of going to the official dashboard. That's a really nice thing about the mobile hub, just kind of focuses on what you need to know for building a mobile or progressive web app. Uh, we have Dynamo pre-configured, and in here we have this mobile hub tasks table, uh, and it's, this is the same simple to-do app, so it's very, very simple schema, um, but we can just kind of see in here that we have uh, a table automatically created for us. Uh, we have user data storage configured, so this enables us to have users upload files in an authenticated way and keep those files private and secure. And then we have a hosting and streaming setup for, uh, w this is where we're actually gonna go and push and, and, and run our PWA, uh, but this is on S3, uh, and there's a bunch of stuff in here. So when we actually go and upload this project, the mobile hub generates for us a number of really, really important files. In particular, and we find this in the hosting streaming bucket, uh, in particular we have this aws-config file. So this is a JavaScript file that has a ton of constants already defined for us to help us automatically like, connect to all the AWS services that we're gonna use. So we're gonna go and get that, uh, import that file into our project. I'm gonna use the AWS CLI. I'm gonna do a copy. And this file is actually in our uh, hosting bucket. So I'm just gonna go to the resources here so I can get the name of this bucket here. So if I go down to Amazon S3 buckets, I can see this hosting mobile hub bucket. So I'm just gonna copy this. And then I'm gonna do AWS S3 copy the name of the bucket and then AWS config.js. And then I'm gonna put that into my source assets folder. So this downloaded and we're pretty much ready to go. So we're gonna run Ionic serve, which is gonna go and launch the app after it does a quick build and the app will be automatically connected, and that's really all we had to do. So uh, if we go and look at this config file quick while this is building, so 
So we see inside this config file that we have a ton of constants. So I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't have to go and define these myself because I never would have finished this demo. Uh, but this gets you automatically up and running. Uh, you don't have to even think about it. So, uh, okay, so, so the app is running. I'm just gonna refresh here. And we have a simple login form that is tied up to Cognito, just going to a nice mobile view, and we're gonna go and create an account. So I'm just gonna enter my name, Maxidynic Framework, and then a password. So this is gonna go and send me a confirmation code. We got our confirmation code here. Then we go back to the app and enter this confirmation code. And you'll notice this feels like an app, right? But it's just running in the browser. So you can actually go and build uh, if you're gonna target the App Store, you can build a ton of the app right here in the browser, which is really, really nice. Uh, but if you're building a PWA, obviously you can build the whole thing right here. Uh, and then we're gonna log in. So all this is automatically tied to Cognito, and we have a simple to-do app here that we can go and add new to-dos for. So very, you know, nothing really to write home about, but I need to do my laundry, so I'm gonna make a task. And then this automatically was added to uh, DynamoDB. Um, I can do some other things here, like go and delete to-dos. Um, I can create different kind of category of to-dos for like errands. Um, so pretty simple, basic app. One of the other things that this app offers is the ability to upload a file. Uh, so if I wanna change my profile image, I can go and do that, and this automatically goes and syncs with S3 hosting bucket. Okay, so we have this simple to-do app. How do we actually turn it into a progressive web app? So thankfully, that's actually really, really easy. Uh, all we need to do is copy our built web assets to this hosting mobile hub bucket. And this bucket is automatically set up with S3 static hosting. So once those files are in there, it pretty much just works. So before we do that, we actually see that we're, we're uh, given a bunch of pre-made, uh, pre-configured hosting files here. So if we actually just go and open this, uh, the static site here. I'm gonna go back to the hosting and streaming, view from S3. So before we go and upload our files, we just have a simple web app landing page, just kind of explains to us how to use it, uh, how to interact with the bucket. Now we're gonna go back to the project and do the AWS copy. We're gonna go and copy the www folder, uh, and we're gonna do uh, let's see, yeah, recursive. I'm gonna do S3 and then find that bucket name again. Back to resources. And we're just gonna do that S3 copy, whoops. Unknown options. Oops. Okay. Okay. Cool. So that worked. Uh, so now, if we actually go and refresh this S3 hosting thing, we should see our app running. Cool. So our app's running on S3 static site. And this is just a PWA. So uh, really, like, there's nothing too complicated about progressive web apps. It, it's, you know, there's a few new APIs, service workers, manifest JSON. But really, the core idea is that we're building app experiences in the browser and treating it as kind of a first-class citizen. So, so, so I try to tell web developers, like, don't, don't put PWAs too high on a pedestal because you should just be able to reuse the existing web development skills that you already have. There's a few new techniques that you'll need to learn, but generally it's just web development, and you can use your framework of choice, you can use these libraries to get these things built much, much more easily. So we have a little more time left, so I'm actually gonna go and just dig into some of the code. Uh, so inside of this app, we have a typical Ionic app. If you're not familiar with it, uh, Ionic is currently based on Angular 2, so this is an Angular 2 app. Uh, we are working on a new version of Ionic that uses web components, so it'll be uh, kind of a, drag, uh, a 
pluggable UI framework for any framework that you're using, whether that's React or Vue.js or vanilla if JavaScript if you want to skip a framework. Uh, and so we're really trying to focus on being a mobile UI uh, library that can just drag, drag and drop through web components into any app or any framework. Uh, so in here we have a simple login page as kind of the main uh, thing that we, we land on. And uh, when, we, when we have this form, you enter your data, and we go and call Cognito with this user login. Uh, so inside this providers, like this project comes with a bunch of pre-configured providers for automatically logging in, registering, et cetera, with, with Cognito. So uh, this is an example of the login method. Um, and the, the thing about this is that's nice is we, we're already pulling in those, those constants, pre-configuring it, and letting you actually log in, get the user data, check if they're authenticated, uh, and then also manage registering and sessions. So pre-baked login form that you can use. There's a pre-baked sign-up form that you can use. We have some hooks into uh, Dynamo and Cognito that make it a lot easier to use. Um, but generally, it's just kind of a simple Ionic app. So uh, I recommend uh, checking it out if you're interested in using Ionic. If you're interested in, in building PWAs, maybe you're using Angular, uh, please, please give it a look. OK. So that about sums it up. Um, there's a bunch of resources here that'll be available on the slides. Uh, definitely check out Workbox. Uh, if you want to check out this Ionic 2 starter, the, the link here is on GitHub. It's just github.com slash Ionic Team, Ionic 2 starter AWS. Um, and uh, the mobile Ionic sample, I think Michael will have it available as well. So that's all I have. Switch back. Um, yeah, sure. So I guess uh, you know at this point we're we have a little extra time here. If you want to jump in, um, if you guys have any questions or anything, we can do some Q and A. Distribute it. Yeah, so the question was, how do you distribute the application once it's built? So Max kind of showed some of that stuff. What you could do is um, use the, the AWS APIs or the CLI, or you could even use the, 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 um, the AWS console. You could just upload your files to S3. So that's because a progressive web app is basically just a web app. It's just a web. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it's just on what Max showed on S3, what you would generally do is serve it from CloudFront. So Mobile Hub gives you both, it's called streaming and hosting. So it's streaming with CloudFront. And CloudFront is a distributed content delivery network. So when you do that one command um, of uploading the files to S3, it's automatically also on, on CloudFront. So when you go to Mobile Hub, you'll have a button to view from S3, which you saw. But you also have a button to view from CloudFront. And that's going to give you uh, the CDN version, which is what you'd want to use in production. Um, also, you would use something like Route 53 to uh, um, distribute on a HTTPS URL. One thing is the, uh, the service worker is only going to work on HTTPS. So you're not, you, if you viewed it from that S3 link, the service worker wouldn't actually work unless you put a line of code in there that said, you know, work on, on non-secure URL. But uh, if you view it from CloudFront, it will actually be uh, HTTPS. So it will work. And, <clears throat> and uh, with Route 53, you can also use something like Amazon uh, ACM Certificate Manager to get a free cert and host it on your own DNS. So that's generally what you would do is have like app.yourdomain.com, point that to the CloudFront distribution, and that, that there you go. Yeah, so uh, if the question was, does Mobile Hub use CloudFormation? Yeah, it does use CloudFormation in the background, actually. So you can actually see the CloudFront distribution in CloudFront. If you went to it, it would say, like, Mobile Hub, blah, blah, blah. It'd have a unique ID. So in the background, Mobile Hub is essentially using CloudFormation. A lot of the orchestration services in AWS do that. 
if they're doing things for you automatically, they're basically, they're usually using CloudFormation. Some of the newer stuff that Max showed is actually using SAM, the, the serverless application model. So that zip file that he actually uploaded to there, if you looked in there, will contain a YAML file that's defining the whole, the whole infrastructure with a CloudFormation template. Um, You can't right now. No, you can't do that. But uh, it, it's gonna, it's kind of moving towards doing its own thing. There's a, there's some newer things even coming out to make it a little easier to interact, like on the CLI as well, to just generally automate everything. But it, it just uses CloudFormation in the background right now. But the, uh, the YAML file is defined in a GitHub public repo. So you saw that zip files in a GitHub um, repo. So you can <clears throat> just point to that zip file as long as it contains the YAML file. In Mobile Hub, you can export your app too. So if you went in by hand, that's kind of the nice part because with CloudFormation, if you defined your environment, you, you know there's something like CloudFormer it's called to kind of run through all your stuff and export a CloudFormation template. But with Mobile Hub, you could actually click export and it'll give you that file. And like here's your here's your uh, app backend. You could share it. Did you have you had your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you would do it. Yep, with the YAML file. You can only export it after you've manually created it. Is that correct? You can export it and you can import it. And there's a there's an AWS mobile CLI as well. There's a session on that. It's it's released now. It's brand new. That also lets you uh, automate all that on the CLI and export and import and and share. But that zip file is essentially your source code for your back end. Yeah, so Amazon Pinpoint is a push service that allows you, it's a managed push service. So you can put in your Apple keys, your certificate. It will also, um, it now supports the stage, uh, the, the dev and test certs as well that you can upload. And you can also upload your, your Google keys into Pinpoint as well to manage the push notifications. And then with the, uh, there's a new library announced called AWS Amplify. It's a JavaScript and ES6 based library that that wraps basically the JavaScript SDK. It's very much supported. We're, we're really supporting React right now. Um, pretty much it's released with very a lot of React support, but you could use it in any ES6-based JavaScript app. And then you essentially use the pinpoint SDK if you wanted to do that. Um, PWAs support what's called web push, um, but it's not supported in all browsers yet. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody use it, but <laughs> what's that? Yeah, it doesn't support iOS. Yeah, it's just um, Android right now. But uh, for regular push notifications, you can use Pinpoint. Do you plan to be able to invoke Lambda as well? What was that? Do you plan to be able to invoke Lambda as well? With mob mobile hub? Yep. Yeah, so with Mobile Hub, there's a section called Cloud Logic, and that is Lambda. So it's Lambda and API Gateway, basically. You can, uh, um, if you enable cloud, cloud logic, you can have your own uh, um, Lambda functions for the back end. And there's a few different ways, and this is why the AWS Mobile CLI was introduced to kind of automate, you know, the dev, DevOps piece of it was kind of cumbersome where you can write your Lambda functions and how are you getting them up there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can tool a grunt file, which is what I've generally done in the past. And there's a grunt plugin to automatically upload your Lambda functions. But the AWS Mobile CLI automates all that for you. You can essentially do an AWS Mobile Publish on the CLI, and it uploads all your stuff. So you just enable the Cloud Logic feature in Mobile Hub, and that uses Lambda. Oh, sorry, over here. <laughs> Could you uh, say something about how you manage the software development lifecycle? Like, uh, yeah, for, for mobile in general. Yeah, so that, that file is automatically generated and maintained by Mobile Hub. So it's not meant to be edited. That's just something the app needs to consume to get all the keys. So uh, well, you can do a few different things, and we're actually working on more tooling for that specifically for mobile. But uh, 
if you, you don't generally commit that file, that AWS config file, things like Ionic have a, have a good um, tooling system to build the app. You saw it generated that www directory. That's like your build assets. But if you say you committed that, that code, you would want to generally get ignore that, that config file. And then if you were to use something like commit to something like GitHub, and then you have some hooks to something like uh, code build, we have an automated build service now. We do have an Android option in there to build Android apps. It's not an iOS one right now. Either way, the iOS part's going to be a little difficult. But um, you could fire GitHub hooks on commit to different branches to fire something like a code build or some other uh, uh, build service you want. And you can use Device Farm as well, AWS Device Farm, to run tests very easily. And uh, I keep mentioning it, but the, there's another session I'm doing on the, on the mobile CLI in general. I think it's uh, 310 today, and uh, the, the CLI will enable you to, say, test when you push the, the app up. So that, the CLI really addresses a lot of that, but um, in general, you don't want to commit that file. That's just automatically maintained, and the CLI will maintain the latest version of that file for you, too. So if you enable something like CloudLogic, it will update it in, in Mobile Hub, and then it will pull down a new config file and, and update your local one. So you'd never generally touch that or commit it anywhere. That makes sense? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, there's some other SaaS services that kind of do that, that record the, you know, take screenshots and stuff like that. But on the, as far as debugging on that side, you know, everything, if you're including Cognito and stuff like that, you're always going to get CloudWatch logs for most things in AWS. So AWS um, CloudWatch it is, has a logs feature, if you're not familiar with that. There's, you, most services are going to send data to CloudWatch automatically whenever you're using them. So you can always use that, but you'll want to, you'll generally want to kind of tool up your own, what, what's meaningful to you, you know, and use the services like CloudWatch, both metrics and logging. Um, yeah, the UI, you'd, you'd have to tool something for that. You know, you'd have, you could, with the user files portion like on S3, you could easily snapshot stuff and send it up to S3 even on the, in the, on an interval or something like that and you know reference it or put it in Dynamo or something like that. You can use a key value store in Dynamo and kind of re reference an S3 image or something. That's the way I would do that. Someone over here. Um, I have a question about an app. Well, so we have a desktop client right now um, that's running on Well, it depends. So it, you, what I was showing before was in the, if you're using Cognito, you will be able to access that stuff in the service worker because Cognito will store the sessions, the session data in local storage. So you will be able to access that. You just have to store it in local cache. So if you're doing your own auth, Generally, the session's going to either be stored in a cookie or, or something like right. that. You can always inspect that in the service worker. Yeah, so uh, you can inspect the cookies. You can inspect the local storage. But um, let me see if I can get to this but real quick. Uh, so in, there's session storage here as well, which you'll be able to get to. But Cognito is going to store it here. So here's all the session info. For Cognito, but you can also just inspect a cookie if you if you want to do that. Or, but I'd probably try to use something like like local storage or something to do that. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, local storage is pretty small. I think it's like 20 or, or something. Yeah, it's pretty small. It's not like the, the most scale. That's why index DB is. I'm not, I can't recall what the limits are, but they're going to be a lot higher 
for IndexedDB, though. Yeah, so uh, local storage, you know, it is synchronous, so that's a factor. And then it's not going to be very scalable. It's not going to be as fast, and it's not indexed. There's no keys, you know. It's just a generic storage. So uh, anything production, I mean, generally, you saw, if you, I would use a wrapper. I would recommend using a wrapper like local forage. There's some other ones. Or you can just interact with IndexedDB. But I like using something like local forage because it's going to give you the option you saw to say local, local storage, index DB, or even web SQL, and it's going to manage the driver for you. So you can just specify all of them or a few of them, and it's going to manage if what's available for you. So I would recommend using a library like local forage. Well, Xamarin would probably be a little more difficult because it's, um, you know, it has its own UI stuff going on there. But uh, if you're using something like Titanium, that's just JavaScript and XML, it'd be a little easier. So Titanium is going to use JavaScript, so that, and I believe that's Backbone-based too, so that would be fairly easy. You just have to use something like Backbone. And for that, with Xamarin, I'm not completely sure what what you would do to kind of convert that. Well, yeah. If you wanted to take your PWA and also submit it to the App Store, basically, you would use something like Ionic, and that, which would use Cordova right now to build the IPA or the APK for you. And uh, that's one of the good things, like something like Ionic, is because you could do the serve and work in the browser, and then you could just do a build for Android or iOS or something like that and, and uh, submit it to the App Store as well. You just kind of got to manage, like you see those warnings there, those native warnings. So certain things will work in the browser and certain things won't, depending on what you're doing. So let me uh, double check the number on that one. So it's MBL three ten. That's on the uh, that's hybrid and web apps with the JavaScript and AWS mobile. So it's going to be going over the CLI tool. <laughs> Depends if you're a web developer or a native developer, I guess. But uh, I mean, the, that's why I kind of put those trends, you know, in the beginning. I mean, there's a, there are trends moving towards that. I mean, as as browsers get more popular, I don't really have, I don't think we have any expectations around it. You know, we we are looking to support kind of everything. You know, our SDK. We have a, a very large native. Those customers I showed you, you know, native. Um, application developer base and SDKs. So we have a lot of mind share into AWS SDKs for, for native. There's just, uh, you know, with things like React and React Native and Ionic, there's a large trend to building hybrid apps even more now, especially as the browsers get more popular, I mean, more powerful. But, uh, they're, they're, you know, it's showing strong trends towards using web apps, and there's a lot of things like Ionic and React are really popular because there's a lot of JavaScript developers, you know, so. What's that? Yeah, I think performance is key because, you know, back back a while ago, you couldn't really, you know, they didn't perform very well in, the, in even web views, you know, but now it's, you know, almost irrelevant at this point. And with the native integrations like geolocation and credential stores and federating, I mean, you could do a lot, you know. There's no cost for Mobile Hub. You just pay for the resources it spins up. Yeah, same as CloudFormation, basically. So if they use, if you pick NoSQL, you would just pay for whatever Dynamo, DB services you used, S3, just the resources.
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really up to you, you know? So that's kind of traditional with AWS. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing. So I, I kind of see it as if you're familiar with like Elastic Beanstalk, you know, there's like a, a spectrum. So if do it all for me to tooling it all myself with CloudFormation. So it's kind of similar where Mobile Hub is kind of going to be like that Elastic Beanstalk for mobile apps sort of thing, and it's going to manage it all for you. But we're also, now we have the, you know, the YAML files to define it as well. So um, it's really up to you. But defining the whole infrastructure by hand just in the console is generally not a good practice because, you know, it's not cross accounts. And as you grow, you know, you kind of, I always recommend like either, you know, do something, do use, use CloudFormation at least for some of it that if, if everything blows up, you know, you have something you could spin up in another region or something like that, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in here, if you did something like uh, export here, <clears throat> it's going to download the, that zip, which is what Max was showing. And then in that zip file, you'll see the, the YAML file here. Oops. So there's nothing really here, but you know, you'll see this YAML file, and it's kind of a subset of SAM right now, but the direction is more to just use SAM, but you could, you know, you could essentially tool this all up and, and import it and export it and share it. You could just create this file and import it, put it in a zip and, yeah, upload it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that would uh, for testing, uh, there's a AWS Device Farm. So Device Farm, and particularly with the CLI, you can just add an argument test, and it'll run things like um, fuzz different form factors. But it'll run this thing like a, called a fuzz test, and it'll just kind of click everywhere. So you don't really have to write any tests if you don't want to. It'll just try to break it basically, and you could run it on a a number, whatever de number of devices you want to run it on. Device Farm has uh, even dedicated devices now too that you can kind of provision for yourself and use for yourself. And it's, there's a lot of options there. All right. So, thanks. <laughs>